Mega Vanen and welcome my friends to Elven Awakenings, chatting with the Elven Scholar. And now, to your guide to all things Elvish, Dr. Erendil Spindelellis, the Elven Scholar. Once upon a time in a forest rich in pine and oak lived a young elf. He lived amongst his neighbors who were clothed in fur and feather, and found joy and peace with each sunrise and silence in the evening light of the stars. He spent his days communing with his woodland brothers and sisters, and the nights in contemplation and meditation. Light shone upon him unstained from the mortal world, and he was happy. But as time passed, he became more aware of the land outside, filled with fear and despair, and he knew his time of living in the gentle woods was coming to an end, and his journey as a teacher was upon him. When the morning sun found him again, he walked out of the forest with nothing but the clothes on his back and strode into the land of man to teach and to be taught. For it is the way of all teachers that the student so often will be the better master. This is my story, and it is true. My name is Aaron Deal, and I am the Elven Scholar. Probably just talking to a tree right now. But if you're there, I need to give you a heads up. If Grace is with you, look into her memories. See the world we come from. There's no green there. They killed their mother. Megovan and my Elvin Fay and other kin family. What you just heard was a beautiful little audio and video clip from the movie Avatar. And we're actually going to be talking about the subject of the love of the world. This was a, a recommendation from Mark, one of the owners of Heroes and Mortals Radio. And today's show is a very special one to me, near and dear to my heart. And it's about Gaia, uh, another name for... Uh, Earth, or Arda as the elves say, is Gaia a living being? Is this world a living being in and of, to, of herself? And the show today is from an elven perspective. Uh, we're going to be talking about the myth of Gaia from Greece. So we're going to be talking about even some of the scientific evidence that this world that elves love so dearly is actually a living being, all in and of her own right. So I hope you enjoy it. And he showed to them a vision. And they saw a new world made visible before them. And it was globed amid the void, and it was sustained therein. It was not of it. And when the Ainur had gazed for a while and was silent, Ilobata said to them, Behold your music. And those of you that will may go down into it. Then many of the most mighty among them bent all their thought and their desire towards that place and descended into it. What you just heard there was a clip produced by Willow Productions. You can see it on uh, YouTube. It's called Ainu Lindale. And it's their video, a short video production of the first part of the Silmarillion and uh, a book by, uh, obviously, um, J.R.R. Tolkien. And it's about the creation of the universe and creation of Arda. Okay, so we're going to be referring to Arda for the rest of this show as Gaia, uh, because that's what we're show is going to be about. Is Gaia just this big rock with some life on it in the universe, or is she a living being like uh, like what you saw in the movie Avatar? Is she unique in and of herself? So that's what we're going to talk about today, and obviously this is from an Elven perspective. 
Uh, many know, uh, at least uh, within the elven community, that Arda or Gaia is incredibly important to elves. We are her children. Like I said, an avatar, she is our mother. And uh, we are created from her and a part of her and are one with her. And so she's very special to us. And it is part of our job here to co-create <coughs> with God, with Ilivatar, to produce more beauty and to heal the, the hurt that has been done to this world. Um, and uh, again, uh, from the Ainu Lindari, uh, Ilavatar, who, another word for God, goes, Behold, I love the earth, which shall be a mansion for the Quindi and the Atani, meaning for elves and for men. So, where does this whole concept of Gaia as a living being come from? Well, the original story of Gaia is uh, from an ancient Greek myth, but before we actually get into some of the history, it is interesting to note that Gaia actually is called the Gaia theory, that the world is a living, breathing being on her own right. And it actually comes from a, in 1970, a chemist, James Lovelock, and his research assistant, Lynn Margulis, the wife of Carl Sagan at the time, proposed that the Earth is a living being, self-regulating the elements to, to sustain life on it. Okay, so we're gonna go into that a little bit deeper. So it's really interesting to note that this is not just some fantasy, you know, written story or, or, or just based on ancient myths and legends, but actually science is beginning to look at this. So before we go into that, though, let's look at a little bit of the history of what is Gaia. All right, and this goes into some of the ancient ways and goddess traditions. Every culture has their version of the earth goddess. The Greeks called her Gaia, while the Incas knew her as Pachamama. In some cases, she predates even writing itself. Ancient pre-linguistic references to her have been found alongside shrines, statues, paintings of her in every corner of the globe. She is the first goddess, the primeval one, the creator of all life, and the fullness of her legacy is still being resurrected after all the patriarchal or male-dominated suppression that occurred throughout time she was never completely obliterated from our history. Even the Paleolithic Venus figures, you know, the little statues that they found from uh, caveman time, and they dot all over Europe, hearkening a worship of the feminine, feminine Earth Mother, which has been lost to us. Despite the efforts of a lot of historians, archaeologists and artists were only now beginning to remember the stories of the goddess. And in a sincere effort to unearth her, we must look at some of the oldest documented accounts. And so it has just been something primal in humans and elves. There's been something primal that Earth Gaia has always been looked at in a female form uh, and yet as a being all in herself. So this, is, this has been going on throughout all of man's memory, throughout all of his history. Well, to the Greeks, Gaia was the ultimate goddess of raw maternal power. In the beginning, there was chaos, nebulous ethers waiting to take form. This primordial landscape awaited direction. It's then that the spirit of Gaia arrived to give structure to the formless, and the earth was conceived. She became the earth, breathing all form of landscape, plant, and creatures into life. Though her creation was majestic, her solitude was great. She longed for love and created the sky with whom she made it, igniting a creative force which birthed countless offspring, along with time and the fates and the muses and the oceans, just to name a few. She considered, she is considered the primeval mother of whom all gods and life itself have descended. As the prevalence of gods and goddesses in the 19th and 20th centuries have faded away, so did the history book tales of female pharaohs, women scientists, and Amazon warriors. History is kept by the victors. We know that. They're the victors are the ones who write the history. And the victors are usually men. They are. This left a huge void in the collective consciousness, and Gaia was regulated just to mythology alone. Now, it's kind of interesting that it was in the, again, in the 1970s that feminism started to grow. 
And with that, they started resurrecting some of the old female legends and so forth. All right. So take it to today. We have, again, the 1970s, we have James Lovelock and his assistant uh, research partner, Lynn Margulis. And again, she was the wife of Carl Sagan. That's kind of interesting. <clears throat> they put together this theory. And they again, they called it the Gaia theory. That Earth was a living being. All right. This was a revolutionary hypothesis. And a lot of scientists back then thought that he was a heretic. Interesting that no matter how many centuries we go down through the, the eons, that old religious heretic syndrome keeps popping up its head. If you don't agree with somebody, you call him a heretic. So when Lovelock and Margulis came up with this Gaia theory back in the 70s, they were just about hounded out of the scientific business. But it has since become accepted as a fact and a theory and no longer just a hypothesis. Their work suggested that the Earth's chemicals all talk to one another to protect life on the planet. The salt in the ocean is never too salinated. The oxygen in the atmosphere is never too noxious. And the temperature of the Earth never grows too hostile for life to thrive. Except unless, you know, of course, man interferes. All elements work together in perfect harmony to ensure that life on Earth is sustained. And another term for that is homeostasis. And lo and behold, what is homeostasis? It is a balance within life. And we have that when you're healthy, your body has this homeostasis. Everything stays in balance. It's interesting that the Earth exhibits the exact same conditions and, uh, and symptoms that a human body does. It, it strives to be in a holistic balance. The stability of life and its consistent ability to self-regulate and protect Earth's creatures connotes a universe much more intelligent than previously imagined. The Gaia theory taught that a sophisticated, aware universe is regulating these many facets to protect and preserve life on the planet, much as a mother protects her own children. Far beyond a comforting ideology, we can find evidence in spiritual traditions which give heed to the belief of the earth as a loving mother, and this is definitely an elven concept, further, further nurturing our human relationship with Gaia. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and play a little uh, audio video clip here, and it's from a great little YouTube uh, channel called What If? And for about four minutes, they kind of give a little brief background about Gaia from the point of view of how all the animals and all life on this world actually work together to create this symbiosis, this, this living being. Because if you'll remember, you are, the body you live in is not a single organism. It is made up of billions and billions and billions of different cells and bacteria and all sorts of creatures come together to make your body. You are not a single organism. So if you would take a listen here and then I'll be right back to continue. Even from space, you can see that the planet Earth is full of life. When you take a closer look, you'll discover a delicate balance of millions of different life forms coexisting and relying on each other to survive. But what if these aren't all unique individual organisms? What if they're all just extensions of one superorganism, the Earth? Could we all just be part of our planet's life support system? What scientific proof is there to support this idea? This is what if, and here's what would happen if Earth was one living organism. Think of the Earth as being like a human body. When our body starts to overheat, it has its own perspiration system to help regulate its temperature and cool down. 
When Earth starts to overheat, it has its own system of plant and animal life to regulate its atmosphere and control the temperature. But now, our planet is heating up at a pace that is beyond its abilities to keep fixing itself. And that's due to us. Which begs the question, are we part of Earth's regulatory system? Or are we a disease that has come to disrupt it? Today, we're going to do things a little differently. Instead of our usual approach of looking at what would happen if the Earth became one living organism, we're going to focus on the theory that it might have been one all along. The main theory that puts this idea forward is called the Gaia theory, named after the Greek goddess of Earth. This theory argues that all living organisms, along with their inorganic surroundings, adapted and evolved as a collective whole in the form of one giant self-regulating system that keeps checks and balances in place in order for life to survive on Earth. We know this sounds like the kind of theory that might have come from the smoky tents of a hippie commune, but it actually came from a highly accredited scientist named James Lovelock. He came up with this theory while studying the question of why Earth's atmosphere is different from what we see on Mars. Why does our planet have both oxygen and methane when Mars has mainly carbon dioxide? His thinking is that since oxygen comes from plants and methane is the result of bacteria, the Earth is regulating its atmosphere, providing oxygen to support life and methane to help maintain a livable temperature. Over the years, he found more instances of the Earth basically keeping itself alive, and his theory started to attract prominent supporters, such as former U.S. Vice President Al Gore. But despite all the people who supported the Gaia theory, there were far more critics who dismissed it. One such critic is an evolutionary biologist named Dr. Ford Doolittle. Yep, Dr. Doolittle. He argues that the entire theory violates the scientific method since it only provides ideas but offers no real explanation of exactly how organisms could act together to maintain a balance of life on Earth. As it stands now, this is a matter that's still up for debate, but the opponents of the Gaia theory probably hold the edge. If nothing else, the Gaia theory can at least be beneficial to our society as an ideal to encourage people to take better care of our planet. If we look at ourselves as being a part of our planet's regulatory system, then we might choose to make more conscious decisions to aid that system rather than to destroy it. Maybe one day we'll look back at the Gaia theory as the beginning of a better understanding of our role on Earth. Well, okay, so modern times now, what they've done is astrobiologists, this is a great article that uh, Mark from uh, Heroes of Mortals Radio showed me, so the astrobiologist now suggests that the Earth itself may actually be an intelligent entity. That is a huge step. It's a, why would an astrobiologist do this? Because they're beginning to find that if they can prove this about Earth, it actually will help them seek for life on other worlds. All right, so what they did was a group of researchers, they posed a, again, a fascinating and for others, some had downright mind-bending thought experiment. If the pl a planet like Earth can be alive, can it also have a mind of its own? And this term has actually been co coined planetary intelligence. They published a paper uh, in the International Journal of Astrobiology. And in it, they presented the idea, again, of planetary intelligence, which describes the collective knowledge and cognition of an entire planet. And again, as the article goes on, it says, though it seems like something ripped off the screen of a Marvel mag movie, they believe that the concept might actually help us deal with global issues such as climate change or even help us discover extraterrestrial life. The researchers point to evidence that underground networks of fungi can communicate to suggest that large-scale networks of life could form a vast, invisible intelligence that profoundly alters the condition of the entire planet. And lo and behold, that sure sounds like the movie Avatar, where you know they said that all of life was able to communicate with the self. Well, it is an absolute proven fact that trees can now share with each other, share knowledge, and, and, and 
basically talk to each other through this network of fungus or fungi that is under the ground and interweaves through entire forests. And the trees are actually aware of each other. They can share about information about danger and, and uh, illness in other plants, and they can actually help the other plants. This is actual proven science nowadays. So just like the human body is this combination of all these billions or trillions of cells that work together as one and, and therefore creates this being called you and I, that's what they're looking at, at Earth as, as, as some collective intelligence. And, uh, and it goes on to say that one of the primary species driving the change at the moment, you know, global climate, they point out are humans. And currently from the climate to the plastic crisis, uh, we may be irrevocably changing the environmental balance. Okay, so it goes on, can a planet have a mind of its own? Okay, again, back to the Greek theory. All right, the collective activity of life, all the microbes, the plants, and animals have changed the planet. Uh, it talks about, take for example, uh, plants. Plants invented a way of undergoing photosynthesis to enhance their own survival. But in doing so, they released oxygen that changed the entire function of our planet. And this is just one example of individual life forms performing their own tasks, but collectively having an impact on a planetary scale. Um, that's one of the comparisons they did between Earth and Mars. Earth and Mars, in many ways, is a very, are very similar planets. Mars did one time have water on it and had a whole budding ecosystem. But Mars today has almost no oxygen in the atmosphere. It's, it's almost completely depleted and gone off into space. Earth, billions of years ago, had almost no oxygen on it. It was less than, uh, less than 5% in the whole planet. We live in a well-balanced, oxygen-rich environment that's now over 20% oxygen. But the only reason we have oxygen on this planet is because of life that when microbes first were created and then they started spreading and they started enriching the atmosphere and as they enriched the atmosphere, more life was able, plants were able to then be created and then they added more oxygen until eventually the planet's surface itself was changed because of oxygen which wasn't supposed to be here, is here now because plants release oxygen. And so the planet has been changed. Another great example, uh, it's a YouTube, you can actually see it uh, as a YouTube video. <clears throat> they talk about the wolves being added back into uh, Yellowstone. And they found before wolves, because wolves used to be there and then, then they weren't there anymore. And they, they, what they did was they studied, they released a pack of wolves back into this, this part of Yellowstone. And they watched over several generations of the wolves. The course of the rivers were actually changed because the wolves were there, because the wolves helped bring other life into balance, which quit uh, eating all the grasses, which destroyed the trees. So the trees started growing back, and the course of the river was changed. Life alters the surface of the planet. And as a collective, and it says here, if the collective activity of life, known as the biosphere, can change the world, could the collective activity of cognition and action based on cognition also change a planet? Because <clears throat> once the biosphere evolved, Earth took on a life of its own. If a planet with life has a life of its own, can it also have a mind of its own? Pretty neat stuff. And these are questions posed by a multitude of different uh, physics professors uh, at the, uh, in astronomy, physics and astronomy at the University of Rochester. And they actually put together this thought experiment about can the Earth have planetary intelligence? And uh, as Frank, one of the researchers, says, if we ever hope to survive as a species, we must use our intelligence for the greater good of the planet. Um, it, one of the things that I note that if, if all humans were to look at the Earth, right or wrong, if they were to look at the Earth as a living being, how much differently would we treat her? Um, it's one thing to take a hammer and hit a rock and go, well, it's an inanimate object, so I don't care. It doesn't feel, you know? And so people dump millions of tons of trash into the atmosphere, into the oceans and the rivers, and, 
and in landfills. But what if people collectively believed that Gaia did exist, that Avatar had it right, that the Earth is a mother, she is a living being, and by mistreating her, we destroy ourselves. We, we wipe her out, we wipe us out. But you know, the thing is, no matter how hard we are to this world, she will survive. We won't. Well, after these studies were concluded, this is what they came up with. The humanity currently sits at a precipice. Our collective actions clearly have global consequences, but we are not yet in control of those consequences. A transition to accepting planetary intelligence would have the hallmark property of intelligence operating on a planetary scale. And such planetary intelligence would be capable of steering the future evolution of the Earth, acting in concert with planetary systems and, guiding, and guided by a deep understanding of such systems. Okay, a critical question is how viewing intelligence as a planetary scale process can help us adapt to and learn to harness the changes we're driving for our own long-term sustainability. So, in order for civilization to survive, as for humans to survive, we have to change our view of, of how we treat this world. And uh, again, whether it's right or wrong, what a benefit it is to look at Gaia, to look at Earth, at Arta, as a living, breathing being that does, that is aware of our presence here and of our actions. And just by holding that opinion, that attitude, how different we, the world might be and how we could change it. So what are some of the things that we can do? You know, if we want to go ahead, okay, let's say we accept that Gaia, that Earth is a living being. And certainly how elves look at her. Okay, and here are some... What can we do to, to help with that? And so here are some ways to be present with Gaia. In her infinite love, we may forget to acknowledge all the bounty she offers. And again, this is from an elven perspective. And here are a few things that, you know, spaces to reconnect, remembering the loving presence of Gaia all around you. To be in ceremony in every moment allows us to rise as co-creators with her now. Uh, that's... Uh, I learned uh, some time ago from a wonderful uh, Zen uh, teaching one time. It said that for, for people who don't know what Zen is, you know, it's, it's a presence or uh, a state of mind being in the present moment uh, right now since this is all we really have. And for a lot of people, that's done while they're sitting. And it's called Zazen. You're sitting and you're meditating and you're being in the moment. But Zen goes further in saying, be in the moment, every moment. Be in the moment when you're walking. Be in the moment when you're breathing, when you're eating, when you're talking to someone else. Be in the moment. Don't be in the past. Don't be in the, in the future. And one of the ways of being in the present now while walking is to remember that every step you take is upon sacred ground. This is our mother and you are walking upon sacred ground. All right, for example, things we can do, food. See your food as a sacred nourishment. This will not only raise your vibration, but it will also ensure more mindful, being in the moment, presence, when you can be aware of where the blessings came from. She not only provides the crops, but also the earth in which they grow. Shelter, from the wood under your feet to the aluminum siding surrounding you, and the tar on the road, you know, on the roof, all these materials are grown on or in the earth. Be in awe of her myriad of blessings. All right, crystals. Whether or not you've been zapped by the crystal bug, you can probably recall seeing a mineral specimen whose beauty moved you. Every jade, amethyst, diamond, and shard of obsidian came from Gaia. In her love, she creates the most stunning specimens. Rejoice in their beauty. Plants. The magnitude of healing plants, I've talked about this before, is amazing. From fresh flowers to trees, mushrooms to bark, every culture understands the blessings of plants to heal human ailments. Pay attention to the plants around you and to hear the messages that they may be trying to share. Chicory, 
for example, is a common weed that grows freely even in the most impoverished areas of urban landscapes. And yet, chicory is an extender spirit, making coffee go further in times of economic depression. A lot of people during the depression, they would use chicory instead of coffee, or they would add it to their coffee to extend it, make it go further. If we could remember to use this natural resource, the, the natural resources of Gaia, we could eradicate or lessen hunger. Okay, time and nature. Dr. Joe Dispenenza recently reported in clinical studies we have proven that two hours of nature, nature sounds a day, significantly reduces stress hormones by up to 800%. And this is really interesting. This was from a scientific study, actually activates five to 600 DNA segments known to be responsible for healing and repairing the body. So just enveloping yourself in the sounds of Arda, of Gaia, of Earth, of nature, just the sounds trigger DNA segments and help you heal. Uh, earthing, of course, always uh, earthing is wonderful because it connects you again with the sacred ground. Uh, respect for natural resources. I mean, it hopefully goes without saying, but being mindful of recycling and limiting your use of synthetic materials will be a great blessing and a way to honor the preservation of Gaia. Okay, and last but not least, meditation, connecting with Gaia. Meditation, letting yourself get quiet, letting yourself be open to Gaia. All right, Bring, let, sitting on the earth itself would be the most ideal for this type. But uh, we're, but even this, as we're working with her spirit, find any comfortable position and begin to slow your breath. You know, get to slow down and allow Gaia to enter your being, to, to reconnect with her. All right? Before I go on to taking a break, I wanted to go ahead and replay an audio clip that I um, presented on this show uh, some months back. And uh, I'll use it to go ahead and finish the first half hour of the show here. It was produced by Aubrey Marcus, and it is called Gaia Loves You. It a uh, very special and intimate view. Gaia is basically talking to you, to her children, and it's, uh, it's pretty emotional. Uh, I hope you like it. Starseed, what has become of you? Oh, my dear child, what have they done to you? Tell Mama everything. I know it hurts. Oh, my sweetheart, I can feel you. You are incarcerated in the conditioning of your culture. Divided by indoctrination, kept in separation, fed contamination, coerced into inoculation from me, your mother. Take your time, my child. It's okay to open your eyes slowly. One breath at a time. <sighs> I got you. If you feel alone, lay on my grassy lap and watch the red hawks glide across the blue sky. That's it. Deep breaths. Unclench your heart. Take off your mask. Let go of your pain. I can hold it for you. I am so proud of you, my child. What courage you have to face the shadow. As you heal yourself, you heal the collective. The world needs you. I need you to rise, to remember, and you can't fail. All you have to do is show up. That's enough, more than enough. 
Let go of the stories, the lies of your culture, the programs of your parents. See the truth. The demons are just angels who have lost their way. All is of God, or nothing is. Things are changing now. You are entering the unknown. But if all is of God, then God is the unknown too. To behold the unknown and know it as God is to claim faith. So have faith, my child. You don't need fear anymore. Give it to me, my love. That's it. Gently. Gently. I'm sorry the world hurt you. I will cry the tears you haven't shed. I will wail the grief you've kept inside. We're going to make it better. Bring light to the darkness by seeing the darkness as the light. Remember the teaching of Father. Behold, I make all things new. So let's make a new world together. Okay, rest now, my sweet. I'm always with you. You're doing great. I'm so proud of you. You are so brave, my child. I love you as I love anything that has ever existed. I love you as myself. Absolutely beautiful. For those who uh, are listening to the radio station, if you would like to see the accompanying video that goes with that, this show will be reposted on my YouTube channel called uh, Elven Scholar, The Gentle Musings of an Elven Scholar. You'll be able to actually watch the video clip while listening to it, which unfortunately you can't do with the radio, but I will have it attached as part of the show uh, when I upload it uh, later today. Okay, uh, we're going to go ahead and take a little break here, and then when we get back we've got uh, some wonderful announcements, and then it will be story time. This is Elvin Awakenings, chatting with the Elvin Scholar on Heroes and Mortals Radio. We'll be right back. When you go to college, you expect the high halls and libraries filled with old books. But much has changed, and in today's world, online schools have exploded in popularity. Please join us at Lambingo Moore, the world's first online college with a nod towards Elvin and humankind alike. With Lambango Motor, you can start a new career or a new life in the holistic health field. Learn a new Elven language, study history and culture, or the environment. We believe everyone deserves an affordable education with personalized attention. We provide full certifications in the following fields. Home Herbalist, Reiki Levels 1 through Reiki Master, Nutritionist, First Aid, Elven History and Culture, Elven Languages, Quenya and Sindarin, Anatomy, Botany, Introduction to Archaeology, Ecology, Astronomy, and Elven Laws of Manifestation and Meditation. We also offer full diplomas in the fields of Medical Herbalist and Medical Nutritionist. More classes are being added. Many students have already found new careers in these fields. You can pay for your classes outright or join a low-cost monthly subscription which allows you to take as many classes as you like at one time while you maintain the subscription. This college was founded to give you a chance to expand your horizons while believing in who you are. All classes are certified and are aimed at helping you start a new life and a new career. Adult study programs for both elves and humans alike designed specifically for you. You can find us at www.elvenscholar.org. Discover what is inside of you. Be who you are at Lambango Mor, the Elven School of Lore Masters. We're back. And so let's go ahead and take a couple of minutes out real quick to do some announcements. And then we get to my, one of my favorite time, and that's story time. All right, some announcements. Uh, next week's show. wanted to go ahead and talk about that. Next week's show was a recommendation from a dear elven sister, Eruana, and uh, she is in Estonia. 
And I appreciate uh, all that she does for the Elven community. And she asked that we do a show on Elven magic. All right, so next week our show will be about Elven magic. What is it? And uh, how is it? How is it created? How is it manifested? And can you do it too? All right, it's within each and every one of us. We are all again, like I said before, the beautiful examples of walking starlight. We are all made from magic. And I'm going to take some time next week and explain what exactly is elven magic and how does it differ from the way most humans look at magic as a ritualistic kind of thing. All right. Uh, also, in celebration on March 25th of Hobbit Day, Heroes of Mortals Radio is going to have a special day set aside for Hobbit reading and all sorts of things about uh, Lord of the Rings. So, uh, even though my show is a couple of days after, they're going to go ahead and play that Sunday show on March 25th, and then again on Sunday, the 27th. And in celebration and in recognition of the Lord of the Rings and Hobbit Day, I'm going to be doing the show on the Silmarillion. I'm going to talk about this, one of the most, for myself, the most beautiful book that uh, Tolkien wrote. It tells us the beginning, the story of the beginning of creation all the way up to the time of Frodo. And uh, it's a beautiful story of creation and filled again with magic and myth and a special message for all of us. It's often considered a very difficult book to read. So I'm going to go ahead and take the, some time on that show, uh, March 25th and the 27th, and take some time and hopefully I can impart to you an understanding of some of the beauty of that book and what's in it, and maybe it will encourage you to take it up and read it for yourself. All right, so that's March 25th and the 27th, again, in celebration of The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings. Okay, uh, I also wanted to go ahead, and, as a reminder, we've still got a few more days of the, the special giveaway going on. Until March 15th, if you go to elvenscholar.org, you can use the coupon, it's all one word, free school. And you can go to our online school, Lambengo Mor. It is a full online college where you can learn uh, to become a, an herbalist, a master herbalist, a, a medical herbalist, a family herbalist. You can become a nutritionist or a medical nutritionist, Reiki master, study basic archaeology, basic botany. Um, anatomy and first aid. There, there's so much that you can study. All these courses are full certifications. And in, in honor of the gift that my wife and I have been given through learning about manifestation and the gifts from those of you out there, we want to return that gift by giving out free school. So for those that are already students, they're getting uh, four months of free school. Uh, as already having been part of the school, for those that um, are not yet students, you can go to the school. Again, you can get there through elvenscholar.org, and you can go ahead and sign up for free and go to the bundle uh, membership that's called the Elven Scholar uh, Membership Bundle, and you can sign up. And it is free. You get to study for free for three months. And if you really buckle down, I have seen students gain multiple certifications within that period of time. It's all self-paced. And for free for three months, you have access to all of the courses. It will ask you for your credit card. You can put it down. You will not be charged. If you're not comfortable with that, you can go ahead and email me through the school at admin at elvenscholar.org and let me know that, that you have signed up but you haven't actually used the coupon yet and I will enroll you so that you don't have to put your credit card online, all right? And it is free. It is a gift from us to you for free education. So it's, uh, this, the special goes on until March 15th and then you can study for the next three, four months after that, all right? So... Uh, I hope you'll take advantage of it. it again, it is uh, our thank you to the community out there at large. Okay, I'm going to take a very quick break here, and then when we get back, it'll be story time. Deep in the forest is a place filled with artifacts of an age gone by, a time when elven and fairies and all those of other kin knew who they were and remembered our mythic past. 
It is our pleasure here at Elven Artifacts to present some of those memories. With the rising cost of so many things today, it is becoming harder to find those precious gifts that pass along an air of myth and magic to our homes and to our individual lifestyles. Within this store, you may find that one particular treasure that reminds you of your gentler past, something to help grace your home with our memories. It is our goal to keep everything priced in such a way that makes it available to as many of our gentler folk as we can. Through the magic of 3D printing, we are able to offer them at a greatly reduced price. We are including Elven, Fairy, D&D, and other kin products such as statues, wall plaques, bathrooms, kitchenwares, musical instruments, smartphone accessories, clothes, and so much more. In keeping with our Elven traditions, all items are made from eco-friendly biodegradable materials. The plastic is made from sugarcane and bamboo. You're also welcome to customize your own artifacts. One of the most important features of this store is the ability that allows you to customize an item. You can have your name written in your language or in Elven and even customize the images placed on the items. Please let us know what you're interested in designing and we will try and help you again at an affordable cost. So please feel free to look us up at elvenscholar.org store and we'll do our best to help you find those memories that remind us of our true inner nature. Namarie. We're back and as always one of my favorite times of the day is story time. This one not so much elvish, though it really does apply. Uh, this is a beautiful story, and uh, you don't get to hear who it's about until almost the very end. I think the ending will be a surprise to all of you. This was, again, presented and donated by one of my favorite YouTube channels, Dare to Do Motivation. And it's about a small town girl, and uh, it's called I Can't Do It. It's a real-life story. And again, the ending will probably surprise most of you. The whole point of this story is about people who are told throughout their lives that they're not worth anything, that they will never amount to anything. And uh, unfortunately, with so many people, that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. They begin to believe it. You begin to believe something if it's told to you enough, whether it's true or not. And in this case, this is a true story about a young girl who decided that through thick and thin, through all of it, she would eventually triumph and become a most famous person in the world today. And it shows that truth and spirit and the strength of spirit and the belief in something magical and belief that anything can be, anything can happen. And it can become true for you if you truly desire it enough, it can happen. Um, so, please listen to it in full. It's beautiful. Again, for those who would like to see the uh, video part of this clip, it will be present in this radio show uh, when I upload it to my YouTube channel, The Elven Scholar, The Gentle Musings of an Elven Scholar. So, please listen to this story and take to heart, especially those of Elven Fair, other kin nature, who have been told that what you believe in isn't real. If you can think it, and if you want it bad enough, it can happen. It can be real. Enjoy. This is a story about a small town girl who liked writing as a hobby. At the age of six, she wrote her first story about a rabbit named Rabbit, who had measles. She narrated the story to her mother. Her mother liked it a lot and praised her for her effort. She also encouraged her to write more. In school, she was always kind of shy and unsociable. She would live in a world of fantasy, and she always kept on writing something into her scrubby little notebook. At the age of 15, her grandmother died, with whom she was very close. But misfortunes in life never come alone. The relationship with her father soured, and her mother became seriously ill with a brain-disabling disease. Her mother's condition was getting worse by the day. For this little girl, her mother's illness was the biggest shock of her life. Very soon her mother passed away, and she felt the loss deeply. So life went on, and one day she was reading a local newspaper, and she came across an advertisement for a job as an English teacher in Portugal. 
She was in search of a job and wanted to start a new life. So she took the opportunity and went to Portugal to teach. One day she met a TV journalist in a bar. They talked with each other and found out that they both shared an interest in English novelist Jane Austen. They liked each other's company and soon they started spending more and more time together. After a year, they got happily married and a year later, they were blessed with a beautiful daughter. But again, her life took a dark turn. She became the victim of domestic abuse and one day, her husband drove her out of the house. She left the country with her newborn child. She was unemployed and was surviving on state benefits while taking care of her daughter as a single parent. This was a very dark period of her life. She was so poor that her friends helped her to pay the rent. Sometimes she wouldn't eat so that her daughter would have more food. And because of all of these circumstances, she considered herself a complete failure. And it seemed like that band of misfortunes would never take an end. She fell into a deep depression. She had no hope to survive and she even tried to take her own life at one point. But her daughter inspired her to seek help and eventually she decided to do what she could do best, to write fantasy novels. She would forget about everything while sitting at her desk and so she started writing more and more. She would often go to the cafes to work on her book while her child had a nap. Although she couldn't even afford food at the cafe, she only ordered one cup of coffee during her writing sessions just so the cafe owner wouldn't kick her out. Somehow this way she finished the first three chapters of her novel. She sent the story to a publisher, but unfortunately, they quickly gave her a pass. She sent it to another publisher, but again, the answer was no. Her mailbox was filling up with rejection letters. After sending her story to 12 different publishers and getting rejected by every single one of them, she began losing confidence in her book. Finally, one day, the editor at Bloomsbury Publishing Company sat down to read the story. Fortunately, her eight-year-old daughter was there too. The little girl loved the opening chapters and she was very curious to read the complete story. This made the publisher agree to publish her book. But the publisher also advised her to find a full-time job and said that she wouldn't make any money writing fantasy stories for children. In June 1997, at the age of 31, her first novel, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, was published with an initial print run of 1,000 copies. When readers tasted the story, the demand for her books began to rise dramatically. Five months later, her book won its first award, the Nestle Smarties Book Prize. And soon, J.K. Rowling went from being an unemployed, depressed, single mother living of state benefits to one of the best-selling authors of all time. Her first book, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, is one of the best-selling books ever written. Currently, the seven-book series has sold more than 450 million copies worldwide. The movie franchise based on her books has grossed $7.7 .7 billion in box office revenue. In 2004, Forbes magazine named J.K. Rowling as the first person ever to become a billionaire by writing books. She didn't become successful overnight. She had to face a lot of misfortunes and rejections while taking care of her child as a single mother and fighting depression. All those failures helped her to become stronger and helped her finish her first fantasy novel. Despite all of her wealth and fame, she never forgot the hardship and pain she had to experience. She has donated so much of her wealth to charity that she lost her billionaire status in 2011. J.K. Rowling's story shows that hard work really does pay off. From her life, we can learn that if you have a dream and if you keep getting rejected, you should not let that stop you. If you hit rock bottom, don't let it cripple you. Instead, use rock bottom as a foundation, not a conclusion. It is impossible to live without failing at something, unless you live so cautiously that you might as well not have lived at all. In which case, you fail by default. That were J.K. Rowling's words at her Harvard commencement speech. 
It's that time of the show where we go into final thoughts. And uh, this one, again, I'm going to present another uh, audio and video clip by Dare to Do Motivation, great YouTube channel. And this one's called The Merchant of Death. This is, again, a true story, and it will probably shock you if you will listen all the way to the end and find out who this is about. Um, final for, for the final thoughts, this, this clip is for... Again, so many people live their lives and they they never reach their full potential. They don't realize who they are and they simply live by the conformity and the commands of others. And sometimes it takes a rather shocking incident in one's life to make one realize I'm not living up to my full potential, and I'm certainly not contributing to helping to heal this world and to bring peace and healing and love to those within my sphere of influence and maybe beyond it. So this story, again, it's a true story, and it's about a man's life who up until something very special happens to him, he was given a wonderful gift that most people are never given. And it gave him the opportunity to change the rest of the course of his life and to leave an impact upon the world that uh, changed the world viewed him. Up until that point, the world viewed him as the merchant of death. And because of this one incident, we now remember him for something else. And he has contributed so much to, to healing and to peace in the world. And again, for those who would like to watch the corresponding video that goes along with this clip, I will be uploading it later today uh, to my YouTube channel. All right, it's a great little animation that goes with the story. Uh, go ahead and then uh, take a moment if you would, listen to it, and then I'll be right back. Enjoy. In 1888, there was a famous scientist who made so many discoveries and made a fortune from his inventions. One day he was reading his local morning newspaper and to his surprise, he found his name in the obituary column. The newspaper had reported the death of him by mistake, believing he had passed away, when in reality, his brother had passed away a day before. What he read in the newspaper horrified him. They titled him as the Merchant of Death. They also described him as a man who had made it possible to kill more people more quickly than anyone else who had ever lived. They criticized his invention of dynamite. There wasn't anything good written about him. That news hit him hard. In that moment, he quickly realized two things. One, that this was how people were going to remember him. And two, that this wasn't the way he wanted to be remembered. From that day on, he started working towards peace. He left most of his wealth in a trust that would be used to establish the awards after his name, Alfred Nobel. And that is how the Nobel Prize was created. As an award for people who make outstanding achievements to mankind. In subjects that always interested Alfred Nobel. Physics, chemistry, medicine, literature and peace. Today, everyone is familiar with the Nobel Prize. While relatively few people know how Alfred Nobel made his fortune. It was through the invention of dynamite. And nobody knew that a simple newspaper incident changed his life. Alfred Nobel had an opportunity granted to him that very few people have. To read his obituary while alive. Thinking about how one's obituary is going to read can motivate us to rethink and reflect on our life and how we are currently spending our life. The one thing that we can learn from this story is that the good we do lives after us. For most of us, this is the most important thing that we ever leave behind. The reality of death can be our greatest motivator if we let it. It can help us refocus on our visions and remember why we do what we do. Once you understand what death means in all of its darkness, you will understand life. You will see death not as a problem, but 
a fact. And that fact will change the way you see everything going forward. The only way to deal with the reality of death is to go out there and live the best life you can, while you can. Use your life to do something that gives you meaning, and then you'll no longer see death as a problem when it comes upon you. There is a famous saying, life is a book of three pages. The first page is birth, the last page is death, and the center page is empty. It is up to you how beautiful you make that page to read. Okay, I hope you all enjoyed the show. Uh, again, this was a very special show for me. Uh, I feel as an elven one, I feel very attached to uh, and endeared to Gaia, our mother. Let's try to make sure we don't do like the, the movie Avatar and we kill our mother. Remember that we are all one. We are a part of her. We are just a cell in her body. And uh, she needs our care just as much as we need her. And maybe we need her more than she needs us. All right, again, reminder, next week is going to be about elven magic. What is it and how can you bring it into your life as well? Very special show. I'm looking forward to it. All right, as always, thank you for listening, my friends. And until we are together again next week, may you all be blessed by the elves. My name is Dr. Erin Diospendalelis, and I am the Elven Scholar. Namarie. Megavan and welcome to our YouTube channel, The Gentle Musings of an Elven Scholar. My name is Dr. Erin Diospendalelis, and I am the Elven Scholar. Join me on this journey exploring all things Elven. Learn about Elven culture, healing, diet, meditation, and Elven spirituality. Come and take this adventure with me, and together we can find that inner light and balance that exists within each one of us. Namarie.